Well, thanks so much for coming out, everybody. I really appreciate it. Um, so my name is Matt Buck. I'm the co-founder and CTO of a company called Voxable. Um, so we're a full service conversational interface agency here in Austin. So we help companies design things like chatbots, Alexa skills, action on Google, um, anything really that is gonna let you talk to a machine. So we love talking about this stuff. Uh, we're fascinated by it. And we want to share a little bit about what it took to get where we are today with conversational interfaces and a little bit about where we're headed. Um, and in researching this history um, of this effort to give machines voice, um, I learned that humans and machines actually began this journey of conversing with one another a few centuries ago. So I'd like to share that story with you all today. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about this history of speaking with machines. And then we'll peer into the future of this conversation between our species and our creations. Um, while this is a place that we're usually talking about chatbots, you know, actually texting with software, today we'll be talking about voice interfaces, and that's really just another form of conversational interface. So let's begin with a little bit of explanation. So if we want to talk to machines, we're going to need two things, right? We need speech recognition. So we need a machine that's going to be capable of hearing and interpreting, if not necessarily understanding human speech. And we're also going to need speech synthesis. So that's going to be a system that is capable of converting text into sounds that approximate human speech. Um, so we need a machine that can listen and can speak. Um, and you'll notice these symbols here on the slides that will denote whether we're talking about recognition or synthesis. So our story of this effort to give these capabilities to machines actually begins in the Middle Ages. So this guy here is Roger Bacon. So he was a medieval thinker from the 13th century uh, in England, and today he's known mainly for helping to refine the concept of the scientific method. So he said that theories supplied by reason should be verified by sensory data aided by instruments and corroborated by trustworthy witnesses, which I think we can all agree is a statement that was just as true in the 13th century as, as it is today. And according to legend, he's actually known for constructing one of these. So this is what's called a, a brazen head. So these were legendary automatons. They were actually these giant brass heads. And they, were, they could answer any question, according to legend. Um, some were limited to answering only yes, no questions. So, you know, totally omniscient, but only have a vocabulary of two words. And here it is scaring the humors out of one of Bacon's assistants. So this notion of having objects that we can speak to, um, that can actually give us access to knowledge that we didn't previously possess, has actually been part of the human consciousness for centuries. Um, but before we actually possessed a capability to make machines listen, we were actually able to begin making them speak. So in 1779, a Danish scientist by the name of Christian Gottlieb Kratzenstein actually produced a model of the human vocal tract. So this was capable of producing the five long vowel sounds. Um, and then in 1791, the Hungarian Wolfgang von Kempelen published a paper on his design for an acoustic mechanical speech machine. So von Kempelen was almost, uh, also famous for the development of something called the Turk. Um, and that was a chess playing automaton. It supposedly beat Napoleon and Benjamin Franklin at games of chess. Um, if you ever wondered how Amazon Mechanical Turk got its name, it was, it was named after that. So again, um, and you can see it, this is a modern rendition of this device. Um, you, it was a model of the actual human vocal tract. It had kitchen bellows for lungs. It kind of had this bagpipe reed for the glottis. It played a bit like an organ. So you're kind of pumping the bellows and holding your fingers over these stops. Um, later designed, uh, or later designs actually evolved to having a keyboard and pipes for the various vowel sounds. So that machine was replicated in the 19th century by Sir Charles Wheatstone. He actually incorporated the interve intervening half century um, of research into his new machine, and it actually kicked off a resurgence of interest in this process of replicating human speech with machines. So this young fellow here, he saw a demonstration of that device. And he was so enthralled by it, he decided to build his own. Um, and he, he built it with the help of his dad. And here he is actually with one of his inventions. So in 1846, uh, Joseph Faber debuted the Euphonia device. And again, this was modeled um, the entire, actually this time modeled the entire human head. So you can see it had a mask with jaws and a tongue. Very, very creepy machine. Um, it was also bellows operated played like an organ with keys for the phonemes. It actually spoke three languages, English, French, and German, 
but interestingly, all with a German accent because the inventor was German and he modeled it after his own vocal tract. Um, so the voice was described as a ghostly monotone uh, and one of the Euphonia's only real super fans was this guy named Melville Bell. He was a Scottish speech scientist. He was also the father of this guy here. That's Alexander Graham Bell with his, his invention. Does anyone know what that would be? The telephone. Um, so this was the most fascinating thing that I learned in researching this was that it was really in trying to give machines voice that we inadvertently created the telephone um, and thus the telephone system and then eventually the internet. So the reason we're all here learning about how to make machines talk is because centuries ago we were trying to learn how to make machines talk. So many attempts at this early speech synthesis were trying to kind of replicate um, and to model the, the human vocal tract. So let's see what a modern attempt to replicate the human vocal tract looks like. Hmm? No audio? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Here, let's try this. So that was me trying to get this thing to say hello. <laughs> so this is, this is a project called Pink Trombone. So this is actually a replica of the human vocal tract in JavaScript. You can visit that website right there and play with it yourself. Please don't right now, it's very loud. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, it's very difficult to get it to work, but you can hear me sort of like by, by manipulating the tongue and manip manipulating the stops and nasals, I was sort of able to get it to say hello. Cool, so this guy here is Radio Rex. Um, so machines have been speaking for centuries by this point, but it was only in the early 20th century that they started listening to us. So the Radio Rex was released in 1922. This is actually the first use of speech recognition in a commercial product. Um, so the way that this would work is you would go up to the little house and you would shout Rex and the little dog would jump out at you. Um, so the way that this worked is it was spring loaded. So you can see here, um, that spring would actually be released by acoustic energy in the 500 hertz range. So it had nothing to do with radio at all. Um, you kind of just slapped the word radio onto things in the 20s to make them sell. Um, but interestingly, it's usually only adult male voices that will produce sounds in that range when saying the word Rex. So it wouldn't really work for anybody that can't do that, like the thousands of disappointed kids that got this thing for Christmas in 1922. Um, but this also marked the first time humans produced an artifact that would respond to a vocal command um, and is also an early example of why diversity is important on your product team. So at the 1939-40 World Fair in New York, there was an inventor at Bell Labs named Homer Dudley and he debuted his latest creation called The Voter. Um, that was short for the Voice Operating Demonstrator. So specially trained operators would sit at this kind of large keyboard and play the machine. Um, they're actually playing individual phonemes. They could control the inflection. Um, it used a corded keyboard like court stenographers use today. If you're interested, I would definitely recommend checking out 99% uh, Invisible. They did an episode of their podcast called Vox Ex Machina. Um, so here we're gonna hear Helen Harper. Um, she was considered the best of the 300 women that Bell auditioned as operators. Um, it was extraordinarily difficult to play. She said it took about a year of solid practice to master the device. The machine uses only two sounds produced electrically. One of these represents the breath. It's all red. The other, the vibration of the vocal. Here, let's try to fix this. What do you suggest? Zoom? Change my... Audio options. Yeah, weird, right? The machine 
Hollywood is only two towns produced electrically. One of these represents the fact. The other, the vibration of the vocal cords. There are no phonograph records or anything of that sort. Only electrical circuits, such as are used in telephone practice. Let's see how you put expression into a sentence. Say she saw me with no expression. She saw me. Now say it in answer to these questions. Who saw you? She saw me. Whom did she see? She saw me. Did she see you or hear you? She saw me. So you can see there, she's using this corded keyboard to sort of like play these individual phonemes. So it must have been extraordinarily difficult to actually use this machine. So in 1961, the engineers John Kelly, Carol Lockbaum, and Max Matthews programmed an IBM 7094 to sing the 19th century tune Daisy Bell, which you might actually recognize. <laughs> Um, so there was a fellow named Arthur C. Clark who happened to be in the audience for that actual demo, which is why a few years later we got this, which is already pretty quiet, so you might have a tough time hearing it. Yeah, it's pretty much inaudible. So what's happening here, this is Hal um, from 2001, um, one of the most famous evil talking computers in all of fiction. Um, so this is the scene where he is losing his computer mind and is slowly singing, Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer, do. So that was um, Arthur C. Clarke's kind of hat tip to this, this, uh, that demo that he had seen a couple decades earlier. So in uh, this here is John Robinson Pierce. He's actually one of the most influential engineers of the 20th century. He's the inventor of the term transistor. Um, so in 1969, while he was working at Bell Labs, he published this paper with her speech recognition. So in it, he really questioned the motivations of researchers studying speech recognition. Um, he stated that there are strong reasons for believing that spoken English is not recognizable phoneme by phoneme or word by word. Um, he actually mentions the Radio Rex in the paper as the last success in the field. Um, funding for uh, speech recognition in the years after the paper was published pretty much evaporated at Bell Labs. Um, in his defense, there was a fair amount of pseudoscience in the field at that point. That's sort of what he was reacting to. Um, but just as a note to any budding futurists out there, never predict what will not be possible in the future. Always predict what will be possible. And, People just won't realize if you're wrong. They won't care. So in 1978, the, this is the Texas Instrument Speak and Spell. Did anybody have one of these? I had like all of the devices in this line, the Speak and Spell, the Speak and Math. I love these things. Um, so this was meant to show off Texas Instruments solid state speech technology. So you had full stores, or full words rather, that were kind of stored in a solid state. Um, and so this was the first toy to use speech that actually wasn't recorded on tape or a phonograph that was really synthesized. Um, I spent hours with these things just because of the novelty, right, of having a machine that I could enter a word and I could have it speak that word back to me. Um, also, for any video game fans, this is actually the earliest handheld device that used, with a display that used cartridges. So let's give this a listen. I've got an idea, y'all. Texas Instruments Speak and Spell. L-R-A-I-N. That is correct. She's teaching her brother with Speak and Spell. That is right. So 
most folks are already familiar with voice interfaces, right? They've been annoying you on the phone when you call into large companies uh, since about the mid aughts, but they were actually invented in the mid 1980s. So these are what are called uh, interactive IVR or interactive voice response systems. So there's nothing intrinsically wrong with them. Uh, many of them just suffered from poor design early on. Um, automatic speech recognition hadn't quite met the proper reliability threshold in the 80s. So as a result, they kind of soured the public on this notion of voice interfaces for quite some time. Um, but there's a lot to be learned from folks that spent their careers building these IVR systems. Many of the ideas in the web speech API actually grew out of the IVR industry. So in 2011, that was when uh, Siri was debuted with the release of the iPhone 4S. What was really impressive was that by integrating with the core Apple apps, it allowed users to solve real problems with their voice, right? No longer was this just a toy. I could answer my general knowledge questions. Um, I still use Siri constantly, mostly for setting reminders, adding events to my calendar. And actually just last year, there was a paper um, released by Google um, by their DeepMind AI research division. It was called WaveNet. So WaveNet is a neural network that is capable of generating human speech. So what's cool about WaveNet is that it actually reduces the gap in performance with actual just natural human speech over the current state of the art by over half. Um, the really cool thing about it is that it can also mimic any human voice. So one day in the not too creepy future, you might ask Google a question and it will respond to you in your own voice. So let's give this the a- The Blue Lagoon is a 1980 American romance and adventure film directed by Randall Kleiser. So as we've heard, um, you can hear over the course of the previous century, we're getting closer and closer and closer to just the sound of a human speaking to you. But that process has actually taken us centuries of effort. So has anyone ever heard of the lyre bird before, L-Y-R-E? So this is a bird that's native to Australia. It's fascinating. It's extraordinarily adept at mimicking sounds. So here's one um, that's doing some mimicking of something it heard. Let's see if you can guess what it is. So this is a lyre bird that lived next to a construction site for a long time. And so it learned how to speak construction site. Um, so there's a company up in Montreal called Lyrebird, L-Y-R-E bird. L -Y -R -E bird. Um, they produce software that given only one minute of recorded voice can actually produce a synthesized voice um, with a pretty amazing level of fidelity. Hey Tom, have you heard about this new technology? Are you speaking about this new algorithm to copy voices? Yes, it is developed by a startup called Wirebird. This is huge. They can make us say anything now, really anything. The good news is that they will offer the technology to anyone. This is huge. How does their technology work? Hey guys, I think that they use deep learning and artificial neural networks. Hillary is right. I can tell you that their team is great. I wish them good luck. I'm sure they will do a good job. Um, it's pretty, pretty impressive, pretty impressive. So um, they plan on open sourcing this work, but it raises some pretty interesting ethical questions, obviously, um, which they, they document on the site, namely how much faith can we now put in audio recordings that we hear of people? Um, there have actually been a couple of interesting papers regarding generating live video of a subject as well. And I mean generating live video of a human saying words that they never actually said. Um, so combining the two means soon we'll be able to generate videos of humans doing and saying things that they never actually said or did. Um, and so in the not too distant future, you will just no longer be able to believe anything you see or hear. Yay, what a wonderful world. So it's only been in the past few years um, that we've seen these ubiquitous voice interfaces, Amazon Echo, Google Home. Um, they're like smart Bluetooth speakers. I'm sure you all are all familiar with these. Um, they're always on, react to their wake words. Um, they give us that kind of functionality like calendars, questions. It's more general. In the Echo's case, it means that you can actually remember that you need more paper towels and then speak those words, words out loud. And then somewhere halfway across the country, a robot in a warehouse starts putting paper towels into a box to ship to your house. Um, you can control your smart home devices, turn on your lights, adjust the thermostat, really control 
your entire environment. And if any of that sounds familiar, then you probably grew up watching Star Trek as well. Um, so this line is a reference to Next Generation. This is Captain Picard's standard order that he would just speak out loud to the replicator and then he'd have a nice cup of tea. So the characters in Next Generation, um, they boldly stride from room to room in their future onesies, turning the lights on and off, controlling the temperature, because Star Trek predicted the future. I mean, one of the most important things about sci-fi is that it teaches us the limits of technology. That's why I think any technologist should be reading sci-fi, um, at least since the original series in the 60s. I mean, the idea of the internet came from an essay in Atlantic Monthly in 1945 called As We May Think, talked about the Mimax. Um, it pretty much described hypertext. It described a typewriter with speech recognition and speech synthesis. So growing up, watching this was always really a dream of mine. I wanted to walk into a room and command it with my voice. Um, and now I can walk into my living room and say, computer, turn on the TV. And that didn't take a team of installers and thousands of dollars. It took an afternoon and less than 200 bucks. So now we've made it back to the present. So let's talk a little bit about the future. I'd like to show a demo real quick that may or may not be real. Shishigaba. Cool. So that was um, the Magic Leap. Um, so Magic Leap, uh, they produce an augmented reality, or as they call it, mixed reality headset. Um, a lot of folks who don't know, they actually have an office here in Austin, and they may actually one day release a product. Um, and so as virtual and augmented and mixed reality move into the mainstream, we can expect to kind of see a tighter integration of those technologies with voice. It just makes sense, right? If I'm in a bulky, bulky VR headset, I can't even see my hands. Um, there's no cursor. Uh, using my voice is going to be a much more integral part of that experience. But what if I didn't even need to use my voice? So I wanna show you another quick demo. This is of the world's first voiceless phone call. So what we're gonna do is place um, one of the first voiceless um, cell phone conversations. There we go. <laughs> nice, nice ring tone. So hi Mike. hi Mike, this is Mike Haynes over at TI. Are you busy? I'm kind of in the middle of something. Oh, I just have a quick question for you. So I can talk um, both verbally and also silently to answer his question. Are you available to meet with members of the press afterwards? Yeah, definitely. Great, thanks. Talk to you later. So that demo was of the device called the Audio, A-U-D-E-O. Um, what is, is really interesting about that demo is that that was in 2008. Um, so this technology is almost a decade old. So what's happening there is he's got this wireless neck band and it's got this patch of center, uh, sensors that run along his vagus nerve. So his vagus nerve is what carries the command to actually produce words from your brain to your vocal cords. So their idea was if we can actually 
play some sensors on that vagus nerve, we can capture what is called subvocalization. So when you are thinking your internal monologue, you might not actually realize it, but your vagus nerve is still sending signals down to your vocal cords as if you were actually pronouncing those words out loud. So what this technology gives you the ability to do is think words in your brain and actually have a computer understand the words that you are thinking. So this technology, which is known as subvocal recognition, actually gives you the ability to think words into a computer. From there, those words could be sent to someone else so that you would have, uh, I believe that's called telepathy, or you could send a command to a machine that could move something to another place, which I believe is called telekinesis. So you can find some really cool demos of the audio, especially um, for, uh, they were doing things for folks with disabilities, so they have demos of controlling a wheelchair with your thoughts um, for folks that are unable to speak, that actually be able to give them a voice. But what was really interesting when I was researching this is this thing disappears in 2009. It's gone. You can't find any more demos. Nobody's talking about it anymore. Um, I found a, a fellow that managed to track him down in a forum post, and he said that uh, the CEO that we saw there in the video said, quote, development continues, but I wouldn't expect availability for the upcoming years. So allow me to speculate for a moment. Um, I would guess that this technology was probably snapped up by DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. They are the folks that gave us the internet. Um, it's kind of the military's R&D arm. Um, because if there's anybody who would love to have actual telepathy, it is soldiers, right? The ability to communicate silently is something that would be very valuable um, to folks uh, whose job it is to to walk around and be as silent as possible. Um, so maybe Zero Dark Thirty involved a lot less talking than we were led to believe. Um, so just a few months ago at F8, Facebook announced that it's working on a similar technology. So this came out of their secretive Building 8 research group. You maybe saw some of the headlines. Facebook is trying to read your thoughts. This is what they were talking about. Um, so the interesting thing about the Building 8 research group is that it's headed by a woman named Regina Dugan. And her former job was the, as the director of the Defense Advanced Research Project Agency. So, total speculation, but take from that what you will. Um, what it means, though, is that things are going to get really weird, really fast. Um, right now, the shortest distance between me and an answer is to kind of speak my query out loud, and then I can have it piped into my brain. Um, soon, I'll just think the question, and then the phone will pipe the answer into my brain, Nobody will ever know that that happened. It's an entirely closed loop. And then I go from not knowing a thing to knowing it a few seconds later. Um, good news here is your kids won't have their heads stuck in their phones um, while they're at dinner. They'll just be thinking insults about you to each other over the brain snaps. Um, what really excites me, though, about being in this space, being working in conversational interfaces, is that soon the conversations will be happening directly between our brains and other brains and the machines. And that starts to create really serious questions, right? About how separate we are from the technology we've created, how separate we are from one another at that point. Um, it also means that the notion of translating speech or translating text into something machines can understand becomes wildly important, right? Because what we're essentially doing is we're gonna have the power to turn human beings into wizards with telepathy and telekinesis, people that can think things and then know the answers or make things happen. Um, so what I'd like for you all to take away from this is that we're witnessing this culmination of what was centuries of effort to enable this grand conversation between ourselves and the things that we create. Um, the reason I do this work is because I believe that the better humans and machines can one understand one another, the better life will be the better humanity's long-term prospects for survival will be. Um, soon machines will be smarter and more capable than we are. Um, and it's really, really important that we have open lines of communication, that they understand us, that they truly understand us and our motivations before we get to that point. And so it's it, the fact that it's even possible to build a piece of software, build a machine that you can speak to in an afternoon is just truly incredible. Um, and it's gonna unlock massive amounts of potential, not just for the technology industry, but for the whole world. Um, if you're really into this stuff, and I assume you are if you're here, uh, you can join us for one of our monthly Voxable Live webinars. We talk a lot. We decided to start doing it on our own and putting it on the internet. Um, we'll help you answer questions. What can I do with bots? How can I leverage them in the enterprise? Um, 
Lauren's actually going to be doing one uh, Thursday, September 21st. She's my co-founder and our CEO. She'll be talking about how to build a conversational design strategy. You head to voxable.io slash live. Lauren's also going to be doing a uh, segment at Austin Design Week. That's um, in November every year here in Austin um, on conversational design. Hope you can join us for that. Um, if you have any suggestions for stuff you'd like to, to talk about at Voxable Live or you want to just grab coffee and chat sometime, please get in touch. Holler at voxable.io. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. <laughs> Do we have any questions, by the way? Any questions? Uh, yes, yeah, so there's, um, there are lots of huge tech companies now pouring massive amounts of resources into this stuff. Um, so obviously Google's got their device, Amazon has got theirs. Um, so lots of huge companies pouring more money into the recognition side of things. One of the problems they're dealing with is accents. And so you'll often hear from folks like they may know how to speak English, but they're not speaking it with a native accent and the machine has trouble understanding them. Um, so one interesting like behavior that's emerged is people will imitate their best American accent when they speak to Alexa or when they speak to Siri. So I heard a guy that said like I try to do a Tom Cruise impersonation and it starts to understand. Um, but that's definitely definitely something that is like understanding human speech is massively complex um, and so much of our brain is devoted to just doing that and um, so much of your brain is devoted to just Picking, picking it apart. So it's gonna be a long time before you aren't immediately able to tell the difference between um, synthesized speech and, and natural speech. We have time for one more. Yeah, you can come find me afterwards. The, uh, subvocal recognition, uh, it looked like on the demo for 2008 that the guy was still vocalizing, moving his mouth Right. I presume that in the pickup of the vagus nerve, that these are not the text of what you're thinking, but only the phonetic drivers or mouthing. Yes, yeah, and that. Exactly, and you have to go through like a training procedure for it to work. It only had a vocabulary of like 200 words at the time, and so they would basically give you words and have you think about that word over and over, and then use machine learning to try to match those patterns to previous patterns that had learned during the training phase. So reading our thoughts might be a stretch. It's reading our intent. Exactly. Can't, can't quite read your thoughts yet, but Google will get there any day now. All right. Matt Buck, everyone. Matt Buck. Thank you.